get rolling. Um, so thanks for joining this afternoon. Uh, name is Justin Rackliff. I work at Fidelity Investments. Um, I, I used to run their OSPO um, and uh, recently switched my role uh, based around a lot of the stuff that, one, is informing this presentation, um, but two, lessons I learned from the OSPO itself of kind of doing it, putting policy in place, uh, kind of assisting developers and realizing there was being a mature uh, company. Um, there were other problems that we had that really weren't policy centric. It wasn't process. You couldn't automate it away. Um, so I decided, okay, I'm going to try to focus it. And so now it's more like a developer advocacy uh, type of responsibility, really looking at how people do their job uh, and some really basic stuff. Uh, so uh, I do collaborate with the to-do group and a couple of folks in this room. Um, I live in uh, Raleigh-Durham, so the Research Triangle in North Carolina. Um, this is my first like conference thing in almost two years, so I feel a little rusty. Um, so as you kind of saw in the title, you can kind of guess what this is about. Uh, you can read the quote if you want, but most of us, if you're familiar with the story of Don Quixote, like, you can remember him going and fighting a windmill. And he didn't think it was a windmill, though. He saw giants. He saw a problem that needed to be solved. Um, now, Sancho, his best friend, riding along, clearly saw windmills. Uh, and the reality was they were windmills. Um, but it kind of raised this, this thing. And a lot of times when I was running the OSPO, um, there were times I kind of felt like I was seeing giants um, and no one else did. They were just seeing windmills. <laughs> um, they didn't really see the same things that I saw, rightly, wrongly. Um, and until I could start resolving some of those problems, I wasn't going to win any, any kind of debates. I wasn't going to be, really be able to make traction because there was just more fundamental uh, misunderstandings that, again, we just needed to fix. So I'm just going to you, because we only have a brief amount of time, uh, kind of three points. That's it. Um, about ways that you can approach this that, again, should be done kind of in concert with looking at a program office in standardizing and, and kind of scaling any sort of open source strategy um, to make sure that when you, when you build it, they actually will come. Uh, that they won't get confused. That they won't be kind of like, well, that, that's neat. Put a lot of work into that. You maybe talk to some lawyers. That's fantastic. But I don't, I don't get it. Why would I do it? I can just go to GitHub and download stuff. Or I can grab an NPM. Like, it doesn't really matter. Um, so, collaborate, demonstrate, and value. Um, so, collaborate. Uh, this is one that's really close to my heart. Um, Fidelity is, again, a mature company. We have our silos. We have individual business units with different motivations, different, different demographics. Some may be managing 50-year-old mainframe apps, and some are responsible for competing against Robinhood. They just have different problems. And as time has evolved, they've kind of broken down their ability to talk to each other. Um, they think that your problems are not my problems, so we need to have our own answers. And we need to kind of, well, you're different. You're a, a retirement business. You're a retail business. You're a brokerage. You're a market data. Um, all of these things, all these kind of uh, different uh, business models um, became essentially barriers to just basic talking to each other. And when we think about open source, like if you don't talk to people, it's not open source. Like it's just not it. If there isn't some place to open an issue or to have a discussion or to throw an email to a, ma uh, to a mailing list, there's no real collaboration. There's nothing there. There's source code, and that's, that's good. Um, but there's not really an invitation to, to do anything cool with each other. Um, so again, uh, like any good 
uh, uh, regulated firm, uh, we have our kind of like for your eyes only kind of stuff. Uh, we have lockdowns and firewalls. And these things may not be physical firewalls. They just may be logical and they may be mental. Just things that get in the way of talking to each other, to sharing ideas, to asking for help. Because those things can be perceived as threats. Um, and I just kind of position discourse as, a, as kind of an alternative to that. Um, essentially saying, no, you're, you're going to invite people to have a, a longer dialogue around a problem or something you're interested in. Uh, and they, they may not be from your business. They may not be concerned with retail or retirement. They just may care, uh, as novel as that sounds. So a lot of people will just say, well, I just need to deploy Discourse, or I just need to deploy Stack Overflow. I need, I need to solve this with a tool. Um, and there's always a place for tools. Uh, but just make sure you do research. Just talk to your developers. Uh, make sure that, um, because a lot of times tools will get, will get added to the portfolio and no one really knows why they're there and then they just kind of atrophy. They kind of roll off into, into the horizon. So um, look at the way that teams communicate today. Hopefully there's some successful communication and then just see, okay, what can you do to build off it? Is it something that there is a business culture? All right. I mean, it may not be perfect, but work with it. Go off the things that are natural and organic within your organizations. Don't just necessarily throw a new tool out there and expect that magically people are going to start talking. Um, many companies have Facebook for Work or Yammer or even stuff like Slack or Teams to do some level of, of broadcast communication. Are those effective? Are they only used for management? Like, just study it a little bit. Make sure that what you put in place um, is likely going to have a level of success because it's going to make sense for people. Um, look at how comfortable your associates are broadcasting their needs. Like, do they feel comfortable opening an issue on GitHub? A lot of people don't. I know. Occasionally, I've looked at it and gone, oh man, I'm going to make a, a kind of make a mistake here. Um, that can be very pervasive inside the culture. So again, if you throw a tool out there that allows everybody to see what's going on, I'm going to start up an inner source program, and I'm going to invite contributions, well, that could go in a, a different direction than you're expecting because people just may be concerned. They may be risk averse. They may be concerned about what responsibilities that they're going to absorb or be perceived to absorb. Um, and you have to be able to deal with, with those things, ideally before you put the tool in place. Because you can set up your success. You can look at your, com your community goals. You can set up some metrics that are reasonable, something that you can you know, kind of go, yeah, I feel like I'm going in the right direction. Or you can flag a timeout and say, no, I'm not going in the right direction. Uh, there's either something I, I expected that isn't reality um, or uh, just generally uh, a disconnect between your expectations and what the realities your org does. Um, and a lot of times, I know as we've, we've approached InnerSource, uh, we'll get these just kind of almost odd expectations. They're like, who's going to support that? And I go, okay, you're a node developer. Who supports the like the 4,000 node modules that, are, that you've downloaded? And they're like, well, the GitHubs. The community does. OK, well, why is your expectation for an open source work any different than your inner source works? Um, it doesn't mean that you can't support an inner source project. Uh, but that does take some time. You actually have to build a community. And it, it takes some time to get there. Um, so you have to be able to wrestle with some of these problems so that if and when you deploy some solution out there, um, people will, will kind of rationally get it. And you can feel success. Uh, one that is always fun um, is how do your leaders invite collaboration? Um, I don't mean surveys. <laughs> surveys are great. But again, it's, it's a broadcast medium. It's not designed for an interactive type of thing. They're going to cast a bunch of questions out. They're going to get a whole bunch of data back. 
Um, those things are useful, that, but it's just data. Um, you need to be able to look at, if you're going to make a decision as a leader in your organization, do people feel comfortable asking you about it? Why did you choose that? Uh, would this be better? And then what are those mechanisms that enable it? Um, because again, if, if it becomes hierarchy, if it just rolls down uh, from the top, you're going to struggle with things like open source. Because yeah, there is the benevolent dictator for life model, um, but generally there's expected to be a conversation. And if you don't create a mechanism and that people feel like there's a value to having a dialogue, um, not a monologue, you're going to basically struggle. Um, and you could, you could look at doing it in Git. Um, I just did that for fun. Um, but what does your contributing markdown look like for your organization? Uh, can people go to one place and feel comfortable going, OK, this is how to engage. This is the right level of engagement. And this is how to pr propose my thoughts. Um, hopefully, it's not a black hole email box. Like you want to basically be able to track these things and that that person who's putting themselves out there, they're putting a level of risk out there uh, that you are going to be able to respond to it. So kind of that first time to uh, issue resolution or issue contact. Um, you, they want to essentially feel heard. Um, so create a mechanism for people to feel heard. We kind of know what this looks like with source code. Um, just apply those same principles to how you approach your organization. Uh, it's incredibly important um, to, again, foster a level of collaboration, especially from the leadership down. Um, if it's just between peers, again, that's not bad. But it can feel that, again, you're not really solving the hierarchy problem, that top-down command and control, in this case, Moses bringing down the tablets, uh, may still be the dominant culture. And that just creates friction. It's going to create problems over time. Uh, it's going to basically stem or, or, or limit the ability for your OSPO or your potential OSPO um, to really get people to understand why working with a competitor makes sense. Uh, because they're expecting some sort of hard, hard and fast. Um, and then again, do teams really have autonomy? Um, sometimes we get, we get put into an organizational construct. Uh, it could be scaled, agile, scrum, something or other, like whatever, whatever the brand name is. Um, but do they feel like they can make their own decisions? That they can kind of go back to their, I'm going to call it product owner, and say, hey, no, I don't think this makes a whole lot of sense. Um, or are they just going to basically take the order to take the hill? Um, there's a place for that, uh, but it does make these, this concept of collaboration much harder because people are just not expected and they don't think they are empowered to actually ask questions on how people got to a certain decision. Um, they're not being critical. Uh, retrospective prime directive would be like, well, they made the best decision with the, the knowledge they had at that moment, and that's fantastic. Um, it doesn't mean it's the right decision for now, though. Um, only because I don't like uh, using other, other people's property. Uh, you can almost imagine the kind of Skinner meme in your head. It's not, it's not me, it's the children that are wrong. Um, so I didn't want to do the references to Fox News. But, um, but you, can, you can kind of like, if leadership has that mindset where they're just going to push this stuff down. And then if somebody comes back and says, yeah, I don't, I don't quite buy it, they go, no, everybody else is wrong. I'm right. Like, you need to get in, get in front of that. Because uh, it's just, again, from an open source perspective, it's going to create friction. It's going to create kind of a cognitive dissonance that will be hard to resolve. Uh, so, but if you name it, you might be able to measure for it. And you might be able to kind of report on it. And hopefully kind of nudge things in a better direction. What's in it for me? Um, so again, it, this has been talked about a number of times already. Um, there has to be a value proposition. Uh, altruism is great, but 
there's got to be a motivation. For Sancho, it was basically uh, Don Quixote saying, hey, I'm going to make you a governor. So I'm going to take you out of poverty. I'm going to give you a level up, a significant level up to your standard of life, for your family, for your future. Um, that's always in people's motivations. We just need to accept it. Um, so when, when management is coming in there, we need to be able to demonstrate to them uh, there is value in doing some of this work. Uh, so don't just kind of cast things out there. Be really intentional about your metrics. Make sure they're realistic, but be intentional about them. Set up some, some community goals. Set some KPIs. You may miss them. And for me, that's OK. Uh, because you'll be able to say, OK, well, that was, where I, that was my goal. I didn't meet it. Why? And all of a sudden, you can start backing into some of the motivations and things that got in the way. Um, that's incredibly valuable as you're trying to tackle what could be decades and decades of institutional thinking. Um, so drawing clear and bright lines helps to, one, help you know if you're successful, uh, but then be able to demonstrate that back to your management team, to the associates who may want to engage in this program, in this effort. Um, and say, hey, here's an experiment. Here's what we thought was going to happen. Here's what actually happened. Um, good, bad, somewhere in the middle. Uh, and just keep iterating on that same topic. Because we still all have a level of self-interest. And we should have a level of self-interest. Uh, it's important for our viability. It's important for our careers. We want to keep moving forward um, in what, what we do. We're not just there to punch a cart. Uh, so the more that you can make sure that you're representing their interests and helping them see that this contribution that they're making actually does have value. Value to their peers, value to the external community, value to management. Um, it's all, it, it really helps. Um, uh, make essentially things logically make sense to people's heads. They just start to get it. Um, so kind of the, the summary. So review how people communicate today. Don't just try something new. Take a step back and see what's working or not working. Um, and then use that to, to basically inform any next steps. Because if people feel uncomfortable talking publicly or in a large room, um, they may struggle with things like open source and to some level, inner source. So your resolution of that is just not to avoid it. It's basically being very intentional about education and to look at ways that you can, you can help your culture, give people legs up, mentorship, um, inviting others in who, who may not have those same hang-ups to demonstrate how this can actually work at scale. Um, but your, your organizations are rich with experience. That, ex that exists. They have history. They have bias. They have a whole lot of stuff um, that will help you make better decisions in the future. Um, so pay attention to it before you start. Uh, don't just throw something new out there or start a tool or, or download an open source project and put it out there uh, because that leap for that associate just may be too great. Um, invite collaboration into your own leadership decisions. I know often sometimes it, it, it can feel like, well, I'm going I'm to set the standard for everybody else. So everybody else needs to collaborate, just not me. Um, no. It's not, it, it doesn't work in your household, and it won't work in, in open source. Uh, lead from the front. Uh, give your, make a decision. Throw in whatever mechanism makes sense for your organization. It could be a wiki. It could be Git. It could be a web page. SharePoint. Doesn't matter. Uh, put something out there, and then invite discussion. And make sure that you prioritize responding to that, um, because people need to feel heard. Uh, if others, if it, if it starts generating better outcomes, because that's really what we're all focused on. We all want better outcomes. If that generates better outcomes, better morale, 
better MPS scores if you use them. Other people will follow. And organically, this thing will start happening. And then again, set goals. Um, sometimes this stuff feels really hard. It feels messy. It feels fuzzy. It feels gray. You don't want to kind of, I want to see us contribute upstream to 10 projects. Or is it 15? Or is it 30? Like, just arbitrarily guess something. See what works. Uh, see what doesn't work. Um, and you can adjust those goals. Um, failing a metric is not inherently bad. We need to get kind of unlearn that for ourselves. Because sometimes if we set a goal and we say, if we don't make that goal, well, we failed. No. Um, it may have been too optimistic. It may have been too pessimistic. Uh, it's just a measure. We're going to put something in there and see what the results are. And then keep on iterating. Um, and then to close, um, so this one's not quite from Don Quixote. It's from Man of La Mancha. So um, you still need to expect more. Sometimes we, we, we kind of like, oh, man, I'm seeing giants. I, I should really just see windmills. I should be more rational. I should set, set the bar lower. No, that's not going to inspire anybody. You're not going to win those hearts and minds, especially when it's a big organic change in your organization by kind of saying, OK, what's the littlest I can do? Because I'm afraid of a big failure, or I'm afraid of something uh, kind of bouncing back. Um, I will always say, you, you got to be willing to put your badge on the table. Um, you got to be willing to take some risks. And it's, it's going to seem a little crazy at times. You're going to feel a little crazy at times. Um, there's a healthy balance there between a level of, of insanity um, and just being optimistic, knowing that there is more out there in your development communities. There's more passion. There's more excitement. There's more knowledge. There's more value um, that's hanging out there that just needs to be a little bit unlocked. Um, and it's, it's just like innovation. People don't need to be told how to innovate. They don't need to go to classes on how to innovate. You want to see innovation. Show up at like 6 p.m. when they're trying to get dinner on the table and kids' homework's done and off to soccer practice and that. People are incredibly creative when they need to be. Uh, they don't need to be told how to be it. They just need to be enabled to do it. Um, so you're going to need to be a little crazy uh, because that's the thing. Like the, the, the crazy people uh, doing crazy things um, is a little bit fun. And it pulls people to you. So, um, and if you're looking for a job, the career team made me put this up there. Yes, the QR code works. Um, but I think I have two minutes. Um, so, any quick questions before they pull out the uh, the hook? Three, two, one. Cool. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Um, thanks for coming out, taking a risk with all of us. Um, I think we're all a little uncomfortable, but we're all trying to figure out what's, the, what's this new thing going to look like. Um, and it's going to take some time. Thanks again.